All right, there's no no audio. There's no audio right now, guys. Let me give you the cue, Dan. Turn you mic. Turn you everywhere. Go again. Good morning. I'm Dean McKee, Associate Professor of Presidential Studies at the Miller Center, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone this morning to our webinar marking the release of the report of the COVID Crisis Group, Lessons from the COVID War. This report is the culmination of nearly three years of work by the COVID Crisis Group, seeking to understand the nation's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, to draw lessons from that experience, and to help us prepare for the inevitability of the next pandemic. I'm very pleased to welcome our three guests, all of whom have played important roles in the work of the crisis group. First, our own Philip Zelko, the White Burkett Professor of History here at UVA, former director of the Miller Center, and the chair of the COVID crisis group. Professor Zelko has a long and distinguished record of both scholarship and public service, most notably for our purposes serving as the executive director of the 9-11 Commission. He is the author most recently of The Road Less Traveled, The Secret Battle to End the Great War in 1916-1917. I'll also highlight an earlier work of Phillips, the Kennedy tapes inside the White House during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which he co-wrote in 2001 with Ernest May, and which has served as the foundation for the Miller Center's longstanding presidential recordings program. Next, Danielle Allen is the James Bryant Conant University Professor at Harvard University and the director of the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Ethics. She is a professor of political philosophy, ethics, and public policy, as well as a longtime nonprofit leader, democracy, democracy advocate, and scholar, and a former candidate for governor of Massachusetts. In 2020, Danielle helped to lead a coalition that produced the Roadmap to Pandemic Resilience, which was adopted in both federal legislation and a presidential executive order. She is the founder and president of Partners in Democracy, which sustains progress for democracy at the state level. Her most recent book is the widely acclaimed Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. She also writes regularly for the Washington Post. Finally, Dr. Carter Mecker serves currently as the medical advisor for the public health company. Previously, he was the senior medical advisor for the Office of Public Health in the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, where he played a central role in the department's COVID-19 response. From 2005 to 2011, he was director of medical preparedness policy at the White House Homeland Security Council, where he supported the development of federal policies to enhance public health, biodefense, and pandemic preparedness. He was also a principal author of the National Strategy for, for Pandemic Influenza Implementation Plan. Welcome, to all three of you. Uh, we're excited to have you today. And I want to dive right in uh, to go back to the beginning of 2020. And if you could just give us a, a, a sense of what was the state of pandemic preparedness in the U.S. at that time? What were its strengths, if any, and what were the key weaknesses? Well, I'll be glad to, uh, I'll be glad to start. Uh, I think what's fair to say is that the United States um, found itself on the eve of this great pandemic with a system that had been fundamentally designed in the 19th century. That is, there still was no, there is no national public health agency in America, not really, not operationally. So all the operational authority and executive authority is scattered among hundreds of state and local entities. Uh, after 2001, after the 9-11 crisis and worries about bioterror, there was a, a really encouraging surge of efforts to get ready for a possible pandemic and work on pandemic preparedness. That's the kind of effort that actually enlisted people like Carter Metcher, our colleague on the panel, in building some of those early structures. And there was a really promising period of rapid structural improvement at the national level, I think through the 2000s. But then for about the last 10 years before the pandemic, um, attention drifted to other things. Uh, some of the programs were still there, but a lot of the vitality was beginning to drain from them. And so what you had then was a situation where you had a fundamentally 19th century structure uh, for managing a great emergency. On top of that, you had drafted some promising federal programs that in the previous 10 years had kind of been hollowed out. So there were some programs there, there was some money there, but what was missing above all, 
above all was preparedness. Uh, this is not fundamentally a story about follow the science. Um, what America was missing was not science. What America was missing was not actually money. We were willing to spend um, more money than any other country in the world. The biggest challenge was knowing what to do if we faced a great emergency and then being able to do those things um, quickly. From prevention and warning all the way to mounting medical countermeasures. And then our report tries to summarize what we've learned from that crisis about preparedness for an emergency. I'd add a few few more things. The, the federal government, the state and local governments, and, and many businesses had developed pandemic plans over the years uh, since all the work that was performed back in 2006, 2007. But those plans were focused on pandemic influenza in particular. Uh, and those plans focused on protecting employees and continuation of operations and continuation of business and sustaining essential services um, within within the government and also within um, uh, within businesses. Uh, so they weren't they were very specific for influenza pandemic, uh, not more broadly for other potential threats like, for example, a, a coronavirus, which which we um, we had faced. We also had a, a a healthcare system that really isn't a system. But it's capable of really providing world class, state of the art medical care. But even on a good day, our health care our healthcare system is stressed. Um, we had a, 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 a strategic national stockpile which was filled with essential medical supplies that we anticipated we would need in a disaster. They included um, uh, supplies, in, including PPE, as well as antivirals that were effective against uh, influenza. Um, but we had no countermeasures in that. Uh, that stockpile that would be effective against a, a coronavirus. Um, we had surveillance systems that were primarily developed for influenza. Uh, so including our ILI net, uh, the flu serve net, which looked at uh, the prevalence of influenza-like illness in the community, as well as tracking hospitalizations for influenza. But those really only sampled about 10% of outpatient visits and about 10% of the population in terms of, of hospital care. And the data that we received from those surveillance systems was frequently a week or two old. Uh, and so the surveillance that we had going into this pandemic was equivalent to making decisions today with a weather report you received of what the weather was like one or two weeks ago. And so it was challenging. So I'm really glad that Carter made that point about the orientation towards influenza, because that was really very fundamental, but it's connected to the point that Philip made about whether we were prepared to respond in the context of an emergency. Because what the fact that the work had been done around influenza meant was that in new conditions, new thinking was necessary. And that's really what that preparedness is about. Do you have the leadership processes? Do you have the political infrastructure in place, the political conditions um, that can support rapidly rethinking how you're going to respond, rapid coordination across jurisdiction, across a diversity of context and the like? And so the third um, lack of preparedness element I would put on the table does relate to our political ecosystem. We entered into the pandemic with a significant polarization without leadership, either in the White House or in Congress, in all honesty, uh, that particularly wanted to sort of try to figure out how to pull together in a bipartisan or cross-partisan way. Um, you know, we were not that far off from an election. Um, and as a result of that, uh, decisions were just kind of constantly being analyzed um, from the perspective of what the political consequences would be. And in that context, it was extremely hard for the right kind of practical public problem solving to emerge um, through leadership um, in our political institutions. And that was a very serious vacuum. So with those conditions in place, where did the key breakdowns take place once the pandemic actually hits? Is it mostly at the federal level that the, the real problem exists, or is it in other areas of the system, or is or is it everything? Everything. Um, <laughs> oh, actually, think about it for a second. So uh, what, the, what was the system for warning us of an outbreak? Uh, that was supposed to be national reporting of an outbreak. Uh, under international health regulations. That was the whole strategic concept for how that was supposed to work. So that system decisively failed. Our report tries to envision an alternative system. Okay, um, how about um, containment? 
uh, the containment system to try to keep the pandemic out of the United States, which would have required uh, really fast action at the national level, um, then that also failed. Uh, then uh, uh, you have federal crisis management, which failed. Then you had the federal government ab abandoned crisis management and federal crisis management collapsed in April and May 2020. The situation then fell on the state and local entities that were these anachronistic designs. They were immediately overwhelmed and uh, also kind of then substantially failed. And so what you, we saw all over the country is dozens of ad hoc organizations in states where governors would effectively create ad hoc governance structures to supplement or take the place of the overrun public health systems. Uh, you had a, um, an effort to then try to develop medicines, but without the preparedness to do that quickly, no available medicines on hand for this, as Carter pointed out. I mean, you just kind of, and then we're, we begin rapidly improvising, including some really great improvisations. There was a, uh, warp speed is famous. We can get into that some more. Um, at the international level, we created COVAX to try to um, make vaccine doses available to billions of people around the world. And actually, under the circumstances, COVAX achieved uh, quite a lot invented practically overnight. But the, um, the point to notice then is that really at every layer where that system was meant to be effective, that system initially failed. In an epidemic or in a pandemic, you know, you really need to size up the threat very quickly and respond very quickly. Um, uh, outbreaks grow exponentially, and our brains have a hard time appreciating what exponential growth is. It's one of the reasons why we get in trouble with credit card debt. Um, and uh, an, an experience, I think, that we all have of something growing exponentially that we've all experienced is fire. Uh, and we recognize how fire spreads. It spreads and grows exponentially. And I think we all know that the quicker you respond to a fire, uh, the more the, the more easily you could put that fire out. So for example, if a fire starts on your stove, you could put it out with a fire extinguisher. But as soon as half the kitchen's ablaze, that fire extinguisher is going to be ineffective. Uh, and as that fire continues to rapidly spread, it becomes more difficult to slow it down or to stop it. And that applies to pandemics as well. And if you take a look at at the, the opening months of this pandemic, you take a look at January, February, and March, we were very slow to recognize the scope of this threat and very slow to respond. We were slow to really get on a war footing. It really took us about two months. And one of the additional delays, I think, that added to, to the challenge was the delay we had in testing. And without testing, we were essentially flying blind within those first few months of that pandemic. And if you compare at the end of February, the United States had performed about 4,000 tests, COVID tests. If you take a look at South Korea, South Korea by the same time, by the end of February, with one sixth the population of the United States, had already uh, already established 500 testing sites and, it, and had tested 100,000 people. Uh, so 25 times the volume for, for a country that's one sixth the population. So, so if I, I can just cut in before you, Danielle, because I'm actually going to tee you up is in response to your question again about sort of what failed. Um, Danielle's whole role in this crisis, because I don't want to, she may not want to brag on herself, but she was one of the people who in March 2020 stepped up basically to create ad hoc work uh, because of the government failure. And she then formed a group with others say, well, since other people aren't coming up with toolkits of what to do, I'm going to organize it myself. So. Uh, Again, since she might not have been eager to brag on what on the role she played, I wanted to kind of introduce her in that context. She was she was part of that improvised response. I appreciate that, Philip. It's true. I was not going to talk about that actually, but I appreciate your mentioning it. Maybe I'll say a little bit about it. But what I was going to say was, I just I, I was going to point to that moment where the testing failed, where the CDC failed to get a workable test for the country when other countries were already well underway. South Korea. Germany had made good progress and the like. And the reason that's so important is because I think it helps us think about this sort of how we understand what does it mean when Philip says everything failed, right? Um, how dire is that? How dismal is that? In my own view, there was a lot of weakness throughout the whole system. 
But I think Carter's fire analogy is exactly right. And if we had had that piece working, the surveillance that you need to have the intelligence, actionable intelligence that you need early on, I actually think the other things might not have suffered from their vulnerabilities to the same degree. So in that regard, I really think the thing that failed fundamentally was the ability to create and make use of actionable intelligence. Um, that is what I would sort of put at the heart of the story. So yes, it's true. I mean, I think a lot of us in March were seeing that that was the case and we were seeing other countries move effectively. And it was a very strange feeling to be sitting in a university, just a sort of civilian in civil society and feel like, you know, like, oh, you know, somebody's got to do something. So let's just see what we can do because that is what it felt like. It really did feel as if there was a vacuum um, from the federal government. Can you expand on that, what came out of that and the, the concept of the public health toolkit and how, you know, as, as we, particularly as we look to move forward, it can get us around some of those uh, binary choices that we seem to face during the pandemic of lockdown forever or reopen immediately to save the economy. Some of those kind of highly polarized, really unfortunate debates. And, you know, what does the toolkit offer? Well, so but I appreciate your framing it that way. I mean, the, the way we got started, so I run an ethics center uh, here at Harvard, and one of our former fellows many years ago was Ezekiel Emanuel, but he continues to be a friend of the center. And so in February, when I was watching everything unfold, I called Zeke and I said, you know, it looks like there's a lot of work to do. We're an ethics center. What could we possibly do that would be helpful? And his response was, everybody's stuck on the question of whether we should be protecting health or protecting the economy. So maybe you guys could help think about that. So that was sort of what we set off to do in the first instance was just to think through what people were taking as a trade-off. Um, but as we did that, and it was you know no more than a week did it take us to realize to Carter's point that the right analogy was a war analogy. And in a wartime context, sort of a set of existential questions, there's not a trade-off between the economy, for example, and you know fighting the war, protecting life or between health and protecting the economy. We, we couldn't do anything we needed to do without a healthy economy in an important way, but nor can an economy be healthy without people uh, being healthy themselves and having their lives protected. So we realized our job was to really sort of shift the focus and help people think about how to align the goals of protecting lives, liberties, and livelihoods. And the minute you make that flip, it was just sort of very obvious um, that you need that intelligence from surveillance to see where the disease is, to try to connect that to responses, I mean, building towards vaccines, but then also therapies um, as quickly as possible, um, and to let people have the tool to see where the disease is so they can protect themselves. So that did lead to a toolkit that was around the use of testing and figuring out how to ramp up production so that we could deliver at the level that we needed. Um, but testing had to be in those early days, especially connected to contact tracing and also to supported isolation. We were seeing so much spread in context of low income workers, basically, who were not in a position to take themselves out of circulation. And so although professionals were locked down, right, working people were not really. And so we were never ever more than really half locked down, but we weren't giving people the resources they needed to isolate um, and to be able to sort of take the disease out of circulation. So the model, you know, was not that fancy. It was really just what other countries were already doing, um, but it took us sort of having to help do some frame shifting for to make the space for people to see that that toolkit should be used here, could be used here, would help us navigate through what felt like um, trade-offs. How widely adopted would you say pieces of that were? I mean, ultimately quite comprehensively. I mean, it was the trouble is in some sense, the time delay, right? So in other words, when after Biden was elected, he passed an executive order to establish the pandemic testing board, which had been one of our recommendations already orally to people in March, 2020, and then on paper in April of 2020. Um, and then that's why everybody in the country got a set of free tests and the like was as a result of the work of the pandemic testing board and contracts with test manufacturers. But honestly, we needed that 10 months earlier, basically, um, not in that point after January 2021. So um, 
where we had more success, honestly, was at the municipal level, where we did see mayors uh, taking the toolkit and connecting with their public health departments and really figuring out how to start getting supports for isolation and contact tracing and testing going as best they could in their own communities. But to Philip's point, I mean, the job was really quite overwhelming. And without um, the backup from the federal government, um, there was a limit to how far people could get with that. I mean, I, I would argue that we didn't deploy the full toolkit backed by money to do a, a testing program to reopen schools confidently until the winter of 2021-2022. Um, um, and that's probably at least a year, maybe more um, late. And that had really large effects on how much longer America kept its schools closed in comparison to most other affluent countries in the world. Yeah, I, I think that's clearly one of the, the the key costs as we as we think about the legacy of the pandemic. And uh, turning to that, I, I was struck by a point that the report makes um, that was a little counterintuitive to me, but it was fascinating to think about it. And you describe policy failure as driving pol polarization rather than the other way around. And you've already, I think, alluded to that, but can you explain that relationship in a little bit more depth, uh, yeah. how that, 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 that flowed? So, for, of course, there was already some ambient, a lot of ambient polarization in the country, as everyone knows. But in the first weeks of the crisis, there was actually a, a, a lot of fear and anxiety, but also a lot of willingness to take uh, public advice on what to do to be safe, because people were worried. So, there was an opportunity for the country to come somewhat more together around strong crisis management and common efforts to combat this. Um, instead, what the public sensed very quickly is that the leaders didn't know what to do and that they didn't have the toolkits ready. They didn't, we, we didn't have tests. We began offering clashing guidance about whether or not to mask. Um, and then there was the initial uh, lockdowns uh, for you know the uh, in the second half of March, but as the lockdowns eased and became unsustainable, as Danielle pointed out, there was actually no plan for what to do next. And then instantly, what happens then into that void, all the toxic politics rushed in. So Trump uh, begins uh, denouncing his own government, which is in meanwhile turning desperately to blunt instruments as it's visibly floundering and flailing, trying to, trying to figure out what to do. Trump is then moves to downplaying the problem and acting as if it doesn't exist because he's attacking the efforts to combat it, therefore it must not be a big problem. It actually was a really big problem. It's just that the people who are trying to manage it visibly didn't really know what to do. Um, and that then created already by the summertime a really deteriorating political environment that actually instead of bringing us together was driving us further apart. Then Yell's actual efforts actually were all about trying to cross party lines and come up with uh, efforts for common action as she can recount. Um, she had some success with uh, in areas that were governed by both Republicans and Democrats. I mean, at the operational level where people were actually dealing with the emergency, there was a lot of opportunities for people to come together, you know, once there was some leadership and some vision about practical things to do. No, that's exactly right. And I mean, just to point to bipartisan efforts, Senator Cassidy, Republican of Louisiana, and Senator Smith, Democrat of Minnesota, co-drafted suppressed COVID legislation that was quite good, um, that did provide the strategic framework and the vision. But so bipartisan cooperation was possible, um, but it was you know, ultimately sort of disconnected from the levers that were actually driving decision making. That was very painful um, to watch for sure. Um, but I do think it's, I mean, I, I agree with Philip that in there was a sort of early window sort of similar to after september 11th where there was a sense of wanting to come together wanting leadership um and that and i suppose you can call it a moment of opportunity was really squandered at the end of the day so the pre-existing polarization was able to kind of rush back into the 
vacuum um, that was left there. And then I think people have not really understood how tightly the politics of the election and the politics of COVID response were connected to each other. So for me, one of the hardest things to watch was the fact that um, in May, when Congress put forward a package of COVID response items, the package, the, the legislation, that I believe it was the HEROES Act that was put forward, um, also included election-related policies, for example, funding for the post office um, and things like that. And so that meant that the kind of politics about how we run elections were completely entangled with the policy decisions around responding to a public health crisis. And so that legislation sat for months because those two issues had been locked together. And you know that, that one hurts my heart just in a deep and profound way to this day, uh, that our politicians permitted it to happen, that those two things got linked to each other in that way and therefore became immovable. Dr. Maker, how did you see those kinds of political processes playing out, uh, particularly in your role within, within the government? Yeah, it, it was surprising to me uh, of how it played out, for example, with the mask mask pushback. Um, it's something I never would have even imagined, you know, prior to this pandemic that you implement. And I think as people were implementing mask mandates or, or recommending the use of masks, I, I think it was seen by many as a way to begin to get out of the, you know, the 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 other other more stringent actions we've taken to protect society, and so we'd be able to open up society more rapidly through the use of masks. Uh, and what was surprising to me is how that became so twisted around and became so polarized. Uh, and the 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 camps of of masking no masking when it was it was a it, it really was a a um, a strategy that really was helping us out of, of some of the some of the you know the, the really stringent actions we had to take to try to slow down disease transmission. So, you know, during this pandemic, that was really one of the one of the surprises was the the, the take on masking. Public health as an expression of, of personal political identity and in, in yes. other Yeah. Yeah. Then, and actually, that that was also not frozen from the start. Um, we have we recount an episode in the book in which in July of 2020, it's already well into this, um, Republican pollsters came to President Trump and said, uh, we think you ought to really come out strongly and advocate masks. And actually, they had polls showing that the large majority of Republicans supported that. This is July 2020. And Mark Meadows, then White House Chief of Staff, said, yeah, but it'll really piss off the base. And that was that. And then, of course, Trump starts doing things like ostentatiously tearing off his mask after he comes back from the hospital where he was really quite seriously ill from COVID himself and had probably contributed to infecting other people. Let's turn uh, to what's typically seen, I guess, as the uh, the great success of the U.S. response, Operation Warp Speed. And the report, I think, doesn't disagree with that, but you do argue that the lessons are somewhat misunderstood, the true lessons of Operation Warp Speed. And I wonder if you could all speak to that and what that means, what we take moving forward. Well, the um, Warp Speed is above all a lesson in how to think about the relationship of government to, pri to the private sector in a giant emergency. Um, warp speed built on a lot of government investments and research, um, including things like the mRNA platform that then really paid off in the crisis. But a lot of people have this image of warp speed in which they think of warp speed as a research and development program. But actually what warp speed, where warp speed really scored was not there at all. In fact, Pfizer did not participate in the research and development side of warp speed at all and developed its vaccine on time. Well, Warp Speed scored was as a program to manufacture the vaccines on a gigantic scale. And that part of the program also eventually included Pfizer too. The other thing Warp Speed did is it developed a way to distribute the vaccines on an enormous scale using uh, the network of drugstores in America, a plan that was partly developed by a gifted employee at the CDC. So those were landmark successes uh, in manufacturing and distribution. 
Uh, Warp Speed then failed to develop a public campaign to persuade people, help persuade people to take the vaccines. And Warp Speed also adopted a Buy American approach that then backfired. It backfired globally and it even ended up backfiring for American business. Yeah, I, I also think one thing that I, has been lost or I think people don't realize is all the work by scientists to develop mRNA vaccines and vaccines against other coronaviruses, including SARS and MERS, prior to this pandemic, and how pivotal that work was uh, for us to be able to accelerate the development of vaccines. Had that not occurred, we would have been in much greater trouble. Uh, we would not have had these vaccines developed in this record time. And yeah. so, it, you know, it was fortuitous that this happened to be a coronavirus. So it was happened to be a virus that we had been spending time developing vaccines for. We already had development of prototype vaccines. So it was, it was much, the, the scientists were able to pivot very quickly uh, and really accelerate the development of vaccine. And you can see, Guillen, uh, again, this theme is uh, this theme of preparedness. Uh, if you adopt a national security approach to your relations with the private sector, there are a lot of things you do in developing your war winning weapons before the war happens. If you wait for the war to happen to do all the work to build your war winning weapons and prepare to buy them at scale, uh, then you're going to be too late. I think sure. we'll just a we'll footnote there. I mean, the, the other really important point of that, though, is right, you need your full arsenal, so to speak. And exactly the kind of arrangements that worked well in the context of vaccine development were absent in the context of testing. And the contrast to South Korea there is really, really strong. So both, you know, you need the sort of pre years worth of investment in the research that makes it possible for people to respond quickly to actual need for development in a crisis moment. But then you also need those private public partnerships ready to go. And although we were able to do it with vaccines, we weren't able to do it with testing. And I think that contrast is a really important one. Yeah. And actually, to add to that, we not only were we not able to do it with testing, we weren't able to do it with drugs. Right. We weren't able to do it with therapeutics. Exactly. So what speed uh, actually failed on the development of therapeutics. Um, we failed to make the advanced market commitment to buy huge amounts of Paxlovid. When it was being when it was developed in early 2021, the result being that when the Omicron wave hit at the end of 2021, we had almost no courses of Paxlovid available, and we also had no plan for how to tell doctors to use Paxlovid once we made it available. So even to this day, uh, actually, uh, the large majority of patients who get COVID are not being properly treated with therapeutics that are available. Uh, because even now that we have enough of it, we didn't accompany it with the guidance for deployment in the field. I think this is a really important point as we think about future preparedness, because it really is this trio of diagnostics. Well, I should put it in a different order. Prevention, vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. And this is a place where I actually think the public health field itself requires learning and growth. The public health field has been very oriented towards prevention and has really seen that as its job. And so it really sort of under um, emphasized the importance of also paying attention to and engaging in therapeutics. I think the circumstances of different diseases will require different solution sets, but preparedness would mean that you're ready to figure out which aspects of the trio of prevention, diagnostics, and therapeutics um, you will need at any particular point in time. So I hope for me, that's like one of the biggest lessons that I hope people will take from all of this and that we'll think about that research infrastructure, that developmental infrastructure, and those private uh, public partnerships across all three dimensions going forward. So we've uh, received some interesting questions from our audience members. So before we move to kind of uh, wrapping up, I want to take a few of those and they, they follow on some of these conversations. Um, Ellen and our audience asked whether part of the problem was that the leadership of the CDC is a political appointment. Um, uh, and she also asks, does the CDC receive uh, private funding and does that create a potential conflict of interest? Uh, so we can, I think we can take either those specific points or more generally uh, discuss the role of the CDC in what happened in, in 2020 and 2021 um, and what needs to be different in the future. I think the issues the CDC are way more fundamental than that. I think spending a lot of time arguing about whether the director should be Senate confirmed or not is a bit like uh, 
arguing about the arrangement of the deck chairs in the Titanic after the iceberg hits. The, uh, the, the fundamental issue is what should the CDC be? What should it do? I mean, we have this image of the CDC as America's national public health agency. The CDC, to some extent, even has that image of itself. Well, this crisis exposed that it's not. Uh, it does not have the, op it has no operational and executive capabilities around America. It can't manage and it wasn't built. It wasn't built to do these things. It was built to be a research center to provide research guidance to the people who had the authority, which were the hundreds of state and local entities. Meanwhile, we have a whole system in which public health is completely detached from the healthcare system that has all the money, though it's under great stress, and both public health and the healthcare system are detached from the biopharma complex that builds the war-winning weapons. And so rather than debate uh, how we should pick the leader of the CDC, we should be talking about what are the roles and missions of all these different entities that we have in the government? What is the role CDC should be playing in the future? We say some things about this in the report. And then once you've figured out what that role and mission is, we can then debate about then how should you select the head of it. But to this day, uh, the Biden administration, no one has actually laid down what the roles and missions should be of all these different entities in a future crisis. So in a way, we're no more prepared to alleviate the confusion we had in 2020 today than we were then. I will say just to double click on that. I mean, the same thing was true with regard to our, the schools issue, um, the schools closures and reopening. That fundamental issue was just that people didn't have clarity about roles and responsibilities across a whole jurisdictional system. And we did do the work to map that out um, as a part of working in response to the pandemic. But I, you know, will that learning be baked in? Can it help us rethink that project of coordination, development of shared and harmonized missions across jurisdictions is a really open question. So I think Philip put it exactly right. I think the reason we call our report lessons from the COVID war is because just the kind of lessons that Danielle is talking about are so important. And we wanted to publish this report so that those lessons are not lost. A question now from Isaac in our audience, and we've talked a bit about other countries, um, but he asked, what can the U.S. learn from other countries that were better re prepared, that responded more effectively? Is there anything we haven't highlighted that you know, South Korea or Germany or Japan did that would fit into this, into the response you're suggesting? I'll add one thing, which is really just to put a name on things we've been talking about, um, which is about how federal systems operate. So I'm thinking here specifically of Germany and Australia. They all operate their federal systems better than we did ultimately. So for example, Germany, one of the very first things they did was set up sort of data systems. They made sure there were sort of new computing systems in all of their local public health agencies. Um, they made sure everybody was ready to be operating with the same data platform for responding to the pandemic. We did not do that. Uh, we have not had the capacity to do that. It is still not on the agenda as a thing that we should be doing, um, but in order to coordinate across our incredibly diverse and complex jurisdictions, you know, that's got to be fundamental. Relatedly, in Australia, the government immediately set up a bipartisan cross-state coalition of leadership to be working with the central um, executive federal leadership. Uh, we didn't do that, right? I mean, the president was sort of call into the National Governors Association periodically, um, but it wasn't structured intentionally as a kind of bipartisan coordinating council to knit the jurisdictions together. So I, for me, really, this sort of issue of how do you operate a federal system and how do you op operate it specifically in an emergency is a place where there are lots of lessons to be learned from other countries. And we laid a lot of this out in the report. Um, it's really important to stress, don't compare the United States just with a, like a really mo uh, we have this image of the Germans as so totally efficient. Uh, we have data in the report that compares the United States with the whole uh, 300 million people in uh, in Europe. So you can compare, say, Florida with Spain, and Spain does 50% better than Florida. Um, or Italy does 30% better. 
And this is, you know, taking into account the differences in median ages. So this tells you something profound about the way government is organized to be operationally effective. Uh, and Danielle's illustrations are exactly on point. Those are just the kind of choreographies those governments do because uh, they're operationally oriented in ways that our system is not. Its fundamental point is we went into this crisis with a system fundamentally designed for 19th century problems, and it's not good enough. And, and that system it has a public health system and a healthcare system that are totally disconnected. Uh, and that's a major problem. Um, the healthcare system has tremendous uh, assets that could be of tremendous value to public health. All the clinical information that's embedded in within and across our healthcare system, if you could tap into that information, there's your surveillance system almost in real time. Each hospital, in effect, is looking through a keyhole, but it's looking through a keyhole in almost real time. It knows what's happening in its ERs. It knows what's happening in its ICUs. It knows how many patients die every day. The public health system is trying to gather that information through other means, and it's always delayed, and it's always, they have a broader view, but it's always by definition delayed. What we need to look at is when we talk about a, 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 um, a national health security enterprise, what we're talking about is bringing those systems together. It's, it's looking at our healthcare system, which really isn't a system, but in ways we, it did behave as a system, uh, you know, it, it, in, in certain respects during the war. Uh, and I think if we could rekindle that and, and start there and build that kind of connection between pieces of our healthcare system and then integrate our healthcare system and our public health system, we would, we would be able to build the surveillance systems we need. We'd be able to answer questions during an outbreak, for example, evaluate treatments uh, in, in very quickly, like, like UK was able to do with their national um, healthcare system. And we'd also be able to improve care overall, whether in peacetime or in war. And by the way, a lot of this can be done with existing technologies in the existing systems. We're not calling for the creation of a giant federal agency. And you might not even need a giant act of Congress to do this. You do need a driving vision of, of where we want to go and what kind of system we want to have. Exactly. This is so important. I cannot underscore enough how important this is. To put it in a really blunt way, what I like to say is we have a politics that is often stuck on this argument between whether or not we should privatize everything or subsidize everything, whereas what we actually need to do is reorganize everything, okay? That's sort of the basic point here is that we don't need new technologies, we don't need a new agency, but we do need some coordinating reorganization. Where's the spark for that reorganization? You know, who, who takes the initiative to take these legacy institutions, you know, public health, uh, you know, local and state level, <laughs> academic medical centers, uh, you know, these cultural barriers that separate them, these historical legacies that they don't talk and break all that down? You have, have, what I'm looking for is what is what's the next step? And who, well, who moves that forward? Um, actually, I think. You know, the, the easy answer would be, oh, we need, you know, the president to, you know, um, have an epiphany or we need a White House czar. Um, actually, the way change happens is through reports like ours. You cannot read our report and not come away with it saying there's all this low hanging fruit and you come away with it with a better idea of what to, what needs to be done as lots and lots of people get that insight all over the country at all levels, Metro Medical Center, state, local, people working on congressional staffs. Once there's just more and more of a shared understanding of the way things need to work, um, then actually the, the change then, that's one of the ways change happens. It doesn't, uh, often it doesn't happen from, you know, the, uh, the woman or man at the top issuing the grand order. Others, other thoughts on that? Yeah, I would build on the the you know the efforts that started during this pandemic with the cells that were formed locally. Uh, I think that's where it has to grow. It's going to have to be more organic. I, I don't see it starting top down. What I see this is it starts to emerge organically, um, and and I think it builds up steam. 
Well, I can confirm it's happening though too. So I serve on the board of an entity called the Cambridge Health Alliance, which is a, a local medical system, healthcare system, public system. It's um, originally built by the city of Cambridge. It now serves a set of municipalities and it also does run the public health department for Cambridge. But one of the durable consequences of the pandemic is now public health is being integrated with healthcare inside this entity. And as that's happening, that is part of a larger network of conversations. Other people are also trying to figure out how to integrate these things because the lesson was really powerfully driven home. And the book will help absolutely continue to document that lesson, spread it. And the beautiful thing about democracy is we are a continuously learning um, society. And we're structured to tap into our capacity for continuous learning. So I do think that that sort of devolved sense of you know learning happening everywhere, reorganizing happening across all sorts of different sectors is a really powerful vision for how we can achieve transformation. What um so be, beyond those steps, what still needs to happen to get us ready uh, for the next time, whatever that may look like? Well, let me just um, bring the subject a little bit to the global side and to the medical countermeasures point. We talked a little bit about warp speed a few minutes ago. The report has a chapter where we talk about the things that need to get ready for uh, the next dangerous event. And a lot of it is uh, research and prototyping manufacturing at scale across a number of different families of viruses but also being prepared to do that on a global basis with these are global wars. You need a global strategy and you need to organize a global coalition that will wage it. Just a handful of countries and regions will end up doing the decisive research and manufacturing. But if they have the global view in mind and pool their resources, we can be much more effective in doing the advanced work so that if the next crisis emerges, we really can achieve the goal of the vaccine is ready in 100 days. Um, does that require spending money in advance like we do in national security? Yes, but the virus, this, this war taught us that when economists say that pandemics are one of those few things where you spend billions to save trillions, that's not hyperbole. That's actually what happened in this crisis. Yeah, I think, you know, Richard Hatchett, who is the CEO of CEPI, the Coalition of Epidemic uh, um, uh, Preparedness Innovations, um, talks about a vaccine library of building on the success that we had with the, with the vaccines that were developed for coronavirus, that all the work that was done prior to the pandemic on coronavirus really accelerated our ability to develop those vaccines. So his point is, do the same for other prototype uh, viruses. So they looked across, you know, the 260 viruses that that affect uh, human beings and identify 25 uh, virus families, and talk about a focused effort of trying to develop prototype vaccines for those 25 viral families, and perhaps starting with just 10. Um, that's going to take time, but you begin to build there. So in the future, if a pandemic occurs. We already have a library of prototype vaccines to really accelerate our production of, of countermeasures. His goal that he talks about is that 100-day goal, 100-day mission um, to end a pandemic. Just think how differently this pandemic would have been. 100 days from the beginning of January, that's the middle of March. Could you imagine if we were able pr to produce at scale a vaccine by the middle of March 2020, how differently this, va this, this entire pandemic would have occurred. Uh, that's the that's the far you know the the long range thinking that we have to have in terms of how we approach the problem of pandemics of really of really pushing ourselves to really some of those stretch goals. And I'll throw one more thing in Go the ahead. mix, which is rather different in kind from what we've been talking about, but all of the quality of our political decision making um, is directly correlated to what I call civic strength, um, generally the sense of do we have a good understanding of our institutions, of our society, are we capable of cross-partisan compromise and decision making together and the like. Those things would all be considerably improved if we actually had robust investment in civic education in the country. 
Um, and it's interesting that the Department of Defense has actually just started trying to invest in civic education for Americans generally because it recognizes the fact that we have not invested in that fashion for the last 50 years as one of our most significant vulnerabilities. You know, we haven't talked at all about the issue of the origins of the virus. And uh, you, um, your viewers should know that the report does address that. And I think we provide a dispassionate and pretty reliable guide to the controversy. We don't come down hard on either of the major theories for the origins. What we then say after kind of going through the evidence is that it all drives you towards the same forward-looking agenda. And the forward-looking agenda has to do with kind of relying on a different system of global surveillance for outbreak, to determine outbreaks, not on, on national reporting. And the other part of that agenda, which is very important for the future, is we need to get a handle on the riskiest biological research. Um, we are engaging now at a frontier of biological engineering, uh, doing things that were technologically impossible even 10 years ago. And there is some immensely dangerous possibilities out of all this that and this crisis and the controversies remind us about what those possibilities are including possible links to frontier ai and a number of members of our group are working on this problem of how to um, get at uh, the frontier of biological research only a handful of countries are on the frontier of this right now and so it's it's possible to try to make progress here, but we really need to get to work on it. So is it fair to sum up the, the origins controversy then that um, uh, we should really act as though both theories were true in terms of our future preparations? Whether animals... Right, because we don't know which one is true. And so we need to make preparations as if either could have been true. Uh, and in fact, either could have been true or could be but... true in the future. So uh, yes. We should pursue both. Yeah. Neither team has to win that one. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Lisa in the audience asks, and I think this flows from a, a number of those those uh, those comments. But what is the appropriate role for the private sector in these preparations? I mean, what what more needs to happen on on the private sector side? Well, it's huge. I remember, Danielle was talking earlier about the significance of the testing issues. And then uh, Carter was giving some of the different numbers, US versus South Korea. Those numbers grow directly out of two different ways of preparing to work with the private sector. Um, the private sector uh, drove success. And oddly, uh, other countries worked with their private sectors much more effectively than we did. Um, and, the, and manufacturing testing at scale, uh, knowing what to do with the tests when you had manufactured them at scale, lining up the financing so that uh, you could make the market commitments to the purchase of the testing equipment at scale. There's another version of this for drugs. There's another version of this for vaccines. All three of us have been talking about that. Um, this crisis offers all kinds of lessons how if you adopt a hands-off attitude towards this, you're going to get the worst possible results. So you have to treat this as a national security kind of issue and develop a, a partnership with the private sector in order to be prepared for war before it happens. And most of the critical infrastructure in the United States is owned and operated by the private sector. And so you do have to work extremely, every sector, um, you need to work hand in hand, including the healthcare system. And by the way, when Danielle was working on her stuff on toolkits to reopen schools and businesses, one of her great achievements is she immediately included private sector stakeholders in all of her discussions to figure out what would work and be practical for them. Uh, is that fair, Danielle? Yes, no, we did. I mean, both in the original testing work and then in the schools related work. I mean, our one of our mantras was always, you know, all stakeholders. We need to get everybody at the table here. We need people across ideological divides and then we need each category where somebody is being touched by this. So partnership, real network building. We learned a lot from generally Stanley McChrystal um, and his fusion cells concept for how you organize um, around 
making sure you get intelligence where you need it to solve problems in crisis situations. So um, that fusion cell model, I think, is a really good one, and it really trains you to kind of make sure you're bringing all stakeholders to the table. So well, before we move to, to final thoughts, um, and I know it's only a few days since the release of the report, but I'm curious what kind of response you've received to its, its uh, analysis and recommendations so far. Oh, well, it's, it's been very gratifying. Um, the, the day of the report's release, uh, the Washington Post devoted its entire editorial column to um, a discussion of our report and kind of concluded by basically saying, every American needs to read this report. Well, okay, uh, we'll, we'll take that. Um, and then there just have been a number of, and. And the test, the and the responses to it have not broken down along partisan lines. There was there was a really interesting House hearing uh, uh, about a day ago where um, Republican congressman was grilling the head of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten, about school closures, and Weingarten finally said, "You know what? I think actually." We may you, you should listen to what I have to say because we may actually be able to come together on this. And the way we may be able to come together, she says. Then she grabs a copy of our report and holds it up and brandishes it. But if we'll all just do what's in this book, <laughs> we we, um, we can all come together. So uh, I guess that's a good response. Um, and people are beginning. Uh, actually, the people are buying it and reading it. They're discovering that it's direct and it's accessibly written. It uh, doesn't talk down to people, but it's jargon-free. Um, so it's, uh, that's, that's why we got 34 people together. Is um, We tried, to, since the government wasn't going to form a commission to work on this, we had originally come together to plan such commission. We decided we needed to find a collective voice and just speak out because all the things we've been talking about were apparent to us and there is a way forward. You, you don't have to be fatalistic and think the situation is hopeless. It's not. Final thoughts. What do you hope five years out, 10 years out, this report has accomplished? I'd be curious if each of you could, could share a thought on that. Oops. Five years, ten years—is that the time frame you just gave us? Uh, you could choose choose your your, your preferred time frame. <laughs> yeah, well, let's say five years, I guess, because preparedness is that important, right? That you want to act with a sense of urgency, and um, you know, it's a great and it's a hard question. I it, and it's a big, big reach, a big ask, but I would love to see across the country that every state government actually had facilitated those partnerships between public health and healthcare systems. Because if state governments were doing that, then I think the federal government could reasonably build on that. Um, so that we have a kind of coordinated infrastructure on this front. Um, and I think we also have to bite the bullet and face the fact that we have to solve our data systems integration problem across that space. That would be my five-year goal. I would second order. I would second what Danielle said about the integration of public health and and healthcare really building uh, you know a national health security enterprise. I think that's critically important um, for us to move forward. And I think what what I would see in 5 years is is hopefully what we see is a groundswell um that we begin to harden the progress that was made during the pandemic. That really was made kind of informally and on the fly of how do we harden the things that she talked about in terms of what was going on, what's going on in Cambridge. Um, how do we copy that across the country and spread those ideas? I wanna underscore what Carter said. And the, I think there is a chance that we can begin to, what I wanna see in five years is this increasing sense that public health, healthcare and the biopharma complex are being organized for a common purpose of national health security in a way that we'll look back on and say we you know we'll we'll gaze happily at this past system without nostalgia because i want to underscore the healthcare system right now turns out actually to be in really grave trouble we just had a number of our experts together to launch this report and they commented that uh, we have a chapter about the healthcare system being under siege um, doctors, nurses, 
The crisis accelerated a shortage of um, shortage of key doctors, like an in infectious disease, and nurses. That shortage now has turned into a downward spiral. The nursing shortage is now a a major crisis in many of America's metro centers. I think has not well been has not been well publicized. Um, we think, well, yeah, public health is ragged. Um, biopharma is off on its own, but at least our healthcare system is a glittering jewel. And I'm just going to tell you that people who are working on the front lines in that system right now are actually seeing that the COVID war has pushed the system now into a downward spiral of growing crisis. And if we come together around the, the this national enterprise vision, which is not a necessarily, a, we're not getting into single payer or any of that stuff. Uh, this vision, though, of, of connecting these different parts of the system, there is a way in which we might be able to make them all strong. Well, um, I certainly urge our audience to read read the report, to do what you can to push for its recommendations. I want to thank all three of you for your time this morning. This has been a wonderful session. More importantly, I want to thank you for your service. Uh, I think you've really made a massive contribution uh, and uh, that I, I hope will bear fruition in the years to come. It's very, very important. And I'm uh, just thrilled to have had, had the opportunity to talk with you this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye, everyone.